Hi, everyone, and welcome to our unit on nuclear energy. There's going to be a lot of places in here where you'll see the word video written. It means that in the notes section, you can see a video that relates to the topic at hand. I'm not going to play those videos during um, this presentation, but just know that they're there for you. Firstly, let's start by looking at what uranium actually is. Up here, you can see it in its natural state. If you were out in Wyoming, you'd simply be able to stumble across rocks that look like this, and they have uranium inside them. Then this is yellow cake. This is after we've taken the rock away from the uranium compound. Then it undergoes this process called enrichment in which we actually end up at our nuclear fuel. Lastly, this is the, uh, the box in the periodic table that talks about uranium. Number 92, meaning that it has 92 protons, approximately 238, which is its atomic mass. In other words, the addition of its protons and neutrons. This number is going to be important on the next slide. Uranium-235 versus 238. So as we said, uranium is the heaviest natural element which is why it's chosen to be used in, nat in uh, nuclear fuels, because the larger the, the nucleus, then the more energy that can be uh, produced when it is ripped apart or, fizz or undergoes nuclear fission. Um, isotope. The word isotope means an element of the same type with a different mass. You can see here, this is uranium-238 and this is uranium-235. These are two isotopes of uranium. How do we get those numbers 235 and 238? That's the atomic mass. We add up the protons and the neutrons. So let's talk about the difference between them. Why are we even defining them at all? 235 is really good for nuclear fission, but it's very radioactive or much more radioactive and it's rare. 238 is not very good for nuclear fission, but it's really common. And so this is why we have to undergo this sort of time-consuming process to be able to up the amount of 235 that's in a natural sample um, or that is in a natural sample of uranium. So here are some pictures. Once I start to really explain the uranium um, enrichment process, you maybe want to have some pictures in the back of your mind about what I'm talking about. We mine for uranium. So this means that we literally dig it out of the earth in rock form. Then this is the process called milling, where we get rid of the rock and just leave ourselves with this yellow cake, um, which is a uranium compound. This is the actual por uh, portion that, it, that is enrichment. All of those metal tubes are called centrifuges. And essentially, the uranium is going to be turned into a gas, and it's going to be spun in these tubes. The heavier U-238 will fall to the bottom. The lighter 235 will rise to the top, thus upping the amount of 235 that would normally be found in uh, a sample, a natural sample. Then, of course, we need to turn it back into a solid because gases don't work very well in nuclear power plants. So we turn it into a fuel. Now, the reason that these fuel pellets maybe don't look like a metal is because they are encased in, they're often encased in um, materials that help to reduce their radioactivity. All right, I'm going to do some drawing on this slide so that you can. Um, so that you can see, you know, as I go through and talk through this process, where I am on the slide. Firstly, remember I told you that we're going to mine ore. So again, don't we're not, we're not going to memorize these numbers. Like, yes, we're going to mine 50,000 tons of ore. But the idea is to sort of see how much this material ends up getting cut down to just get to the usable U-235 uh, that we need. So again, we mine it. Then it undergoes this milling process. This is that yellow cake. What is yellow cake actually? It's uranium oxide, or U308. After we, we've milled it, gotten the rock of, away from the uranium oxide, we're then going to go into the enrichment process. Now, because uranium oxide is a solid, it can't go into a, a centrifuge. So we need to turn it into uranium hexafluoride, which is a gas. 
or UF6. Once it's gone through the centrifuging process, we will end up with about 130 kilograms of enriched uranium uh, UF6. This is enriched because it now contains more U235 than a natural sample would. The enriched uranium um, hexafluoride is then converted into a solid, uranium dioxide or UO2. This powder is then made into the fuel pellets that you saw in, in the last slide. This process takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of knowledge. And so this is why it's so hard to enrich uranium um, and why countries need to have a, a lot of characteristics to make nuclear power work. Firstly, they need to be uh, developed. In other words, they need to have a strong centralized government. They also need to have a strong science program. They also need to have a lot of customers in a given location to make the expense of building a nuclear power plant and enrich uranium have enough customers to buy the electricity that that will provide. All right, so those pellets that we just created and enriched, they're going to end up going into a nuclear rod, which is then going to be put into a nuclear assembly, which is then going to be put into the nuclear reactor. And we'll talk about that process uh, a little bit later. Just wanted you to get an idea about where the United States gets its uranium and what kind of countries are actually increasing the amount of uranium that they produce. So you notice that we do have a domestic supply, but that about 40% comes out of Russian bloc countries, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and Russia. Why is that interesting? Because when we look on this next slide, look at the country that's really increasing um, its uranium production worldwide. That would be Kazakhstan. Humans cannot detect radiation uh, with their bare skin. And so we need to know whether or not radiation is occurring and how much it is. That's where a Geiger counter comes in. So the, these are a little bit antiquated, um, but if we were in class together, I would actually be showing you a Geiger counter that looked just like this one. Now they look a little bit more like handheld GPS units with a digital display, but the clicking that you're gonna hear in this video um, is going to be there whether you're using the older style ones or the newer style ones. Nuclear physics. How can we obtain energy from the nucleus of an atom? We can do this in one of two ways. We can do it through nuclear fission or nuclear fusion. So nuclear fission is what we do in nuclear power plants, and it's going to be the first one that we're going to look at on the next slide. It produces a medium amount of energy. Nuclear fusion produces a whole heck of a lot more, but unfortunately, we need the heat and pressure of the sun to be able to do this well. And so this is not something that we do commercially um, in, in a nuclear uh, power plant. This is done for research purposes only. Now let's compare that to coal. You can see that coal produces the least amount of energy per kilogram. In other words, uranium is a really energy dense fuel source. All right, this is the process of nuclear fission. So let's take a look at each of these pieces. All right, piece number one. Notice the uranium-235. This is, is the nuclear fuel that's being put into the reaction. Now over here, for this arrow, for, for the, the first set of arrows to happen, we actually need a little dot here. And interestingly, they didn't draw that guy in for you. That's going to be a neutron. So anywhere you see this N, N equals neutron. This neutron is going to strike this atom. When it strikes this atom, the atom is going to deform and undergo nuclear fission. So these arrows here, I'm going to circle them. This is fission energy. When it undergoes nuclear fission, this is barium-141 and krypton-92. We're going to refer to these as nuclear waste. That's kind of the bad stuff. 
And we're going to discuss later on in this PowerPoint what we do with the, in quotation marks, the bad stuff. Now, obviously, we've created energy, which is the good stuff, but we've also created three neutrons. I'm going to circle them now. These neutrons are what is going to form a thing called a chain reaction. These neutrons are going to go out. They're going to find new uranium-235 atoms, and they're going to to make this process happen again and again. So see those three neutrons that I just um, that I just circled. The top one is going on to this uranium atom. The bottom one is going on to this uranium atom. And you can see that they are going to produce more energy. I'm just going to put an E and more energy, as well as not three more but six more neutrons. Basically, approximately six neutrons are created for every strike. And you can see how this is going to get exponentially larger and larger as we go along, and that more and more energy is going to be created by each of these strikes. Now, this is nuclear fusion. This is what happens inside the, the sun. On the left-hand side, um, we have a hydrogen atom um, that is a little bit bigger. It's called H3. We also have a hydrogen atom inside the sun that's a little bit smaller. It's H2. Remember, this number here is going to be isotopes of hydrogen. When a tritium atom strikes a deuterium atom, what they end up uh, doing is fusing together. They create energy, that's this here, that's the good stuff. And the amazing thing is that they create a really simple waste product. The waste product is helium. So this is the really big upside. Unlike with nuclear fission, where we're, pre we're creating nuclear waste as a byproduct, in this case, we're creating helium which you know is an inert gas, you know, that goes into helium balloons that make children happy. Oh, and one free neutron, but that's not a problem either. So let's look at those two together. Fission on the left-hand side is the splitting apart of a nucleus. Fusion on the right-hand side is the joining together of a nucleus. Remember, we can't actually do the fusion um, on Earth in any reasonable way to create energy. So we're left with nuclear fission. Radiation. Here are the basic types of radiation, alpha, beta, gamma, x-rays, and neutrons. Neutron radiation is the one that you saw in the nuclear power plant, and it is the strongest form of radiation on this list. I'll just let you take a moment to look at it, and I want you to look at the penetrating power of each of these types of radiation. It's going to be important that concrete stops neutron radiation when we look at the actual um, setup of our nuclear reactors. I'm also just going to give you a moment to scan through this. This list is an explanation of the previous slide. I don't feel the need to read it to you. You can pause the video now if you need more time to read this slide. Now, one of the reasons that we talk about radiation is because um, atoms are going to be more or less stable depending on how many protons and neutrons they have in the nucleus. This is carbon-12. Carbon-12 is really stable. You can think of this similarly to U-238. U-238 is the much more stable form of um, uranium. Over here, do you see how this nucleus isn't very symmetrical? It looks like if you just gave it a little poke, it might fall apart a little bit. That's because it's not very stable. Look how stable and symmetrical um, carbon-12 is. Look how kind of unstable carbon-14 is. This is why uh, carbon-12 will actually break down. Uh, I'm sorry, excuse me. Carbon-14 will actually break down. And this allows us to do things like radiometric dating. All radioactive elements have a thing called half-life. 
And half-life is when we half of the radioactive source has broken down. In other words, when we have, you know, uranium, it's when half of that uranium has become not uranium anymore. It's become another either radioactive or stable element, depending um, on what kind of a an, what kind of a radioactive element you have. So every time a certain time period passes, and each um, isotope of a radioactive element has its own time period for the half life. So let's just say for for the sake of it that it's going to be one minute. So in other words, if we have a sample of a hundred atoms and the half-life is one minute. After one minute, 50, per 50 of those atoms will have broken down. After a second minute, 75% um, of the atoms will have broken down. Essentially, you can look at it one of two ways, the ones that have broken down or the ones that are left. And so every time one minute passes, half of the atoms that, that were remaining break down. We're going to do a lab on this, so hopefully it'll make a little bit more sense after you see the lab. Let's actually look at a picture of what this looks like. So we're going to go to the next slide, and we're going to have a small sample of, ele of element A and a large sample of element A. But what I want you to watch is how these guys break down and how about every tenth of a second, half of the atoms disappear and become not the original element. We're going to watch that again. So this is four seconds. And you notice it takes four seconds for all of the atoms to disappear on both sides. Or in other words, every tenth of a second, it undergoes a half-life until there are no radioactive um, elements of the original left. They're all broken down into something else. As I said to you, each element has its own unique half-life. And so as you can see here, uranium 235's half-life is pretty long. It's almost 250,000 years. So this is one of the big problems. When you have uranium, it takes a really long time for that uranium to be not radioactive anymore. Half-life can be measured in math. So let's take a look at a couple of math problems and hopefully that will make have half-life make a little bit more sense to you. The half-life of zinc 71 is 2.4 minutes. If one had 100 grams at the beginning, how many grams would be left after 7.2 minutes had elapsed? So let's look at the math on this. 7.2 divided by 2.4 tells us how many half-lives have passed, three. Every time it's gonna be cut in half. And so if, if we cut the sample in half once, in half twice, in half three times, what we're going to end up with are 12.5 grams remaining. We'll do some more practice problems on that in class. So again, we're back to the carbon dating. Now that we have a little bit more of an idea about half-life, essentially, when you are living, you are replacing the amount of carbon-14 in your body. In other words, you're eating food that contains carbon-14. So the amount of carbon-14 that you have in your body stays stable for pretty much your entire life. Yes, it's breaking down um, into nitrogen-14, but you're replacing it. So you have this carbon-14 in your body. It naturally decays randomly into nitrogen-14. But you're eating, so you're collecting more and more carbon-14. Yeah, carbon-14. Now, when you die, you will no longer eat. This means that as the carbon-14 breaks down into nitrogen-14, it's not getting replaced. And this is a way that we can tell how long an, an organism has been dead by looking at the amount of radioactive carbon-14 that's still in the sample. 
The downside to this is that the sample has to have been alive. So in other words, we can date things like baskets made out of reeds or cotton or wood, but we can't date things like metal because metal was never alive. Thus, it never took in this carbon-14. Also, the other downside is that once all of the carbon-14 has been broken down, that, um, that sample can no longer be dated using carbon-14 dating. There's a video on this. Um, I suggest that you watch the video. It'll go back over what I said to you um, on the last slide. Also, here is the carbon-14 dating process in a little flow chart. If you'd like to read this more clearly, please pause the video now. Like I told you, we're going to do a half-life lab in class, so I'm just going to skip through these slides. You'll be doing it via gizmo, so you can always look back at your materials there. All right, nuclear power plants. Now, nuclear power plants, unfortunately, fall into the category of doing base power really well. Um, like the renewable sources, they don't ramp up and slow down very well. And so um, we still rely, unfortunately, on coal, oil, and natural gas to be the types of uh, items that power up and power down really well. This is called base load power or what they're good at is called base load power. Um, and nuclear power plants produce about 17% of all of the global electricity. This is our nuclear power plant, the one in Limerick. Okay, we're gonna talk about some of the obvious parts that you see at the top and some of the not so obvious parts. This is a cooling tower. Please keep in mind that what you see coming out of the top of that cooling tower is water vapor. No radioactive material is ever allowed to exit the nuclear power plant. Do you remember all those rods that I showed you? This is the core of a nuclear reactor. These rods uh, contain the uranium. And when they are in different positions, they are able to produce more or less uh, nuclear uh, fission, thus more or less energy. This is the um, control room of a nuclear power plant. I know it looks like right out of the 1960s or right out of some kind of a sci-fi movie, but this really is uh, very similar to what the control room looks like uh, at Limerick. We're gonna go through a couple of slides that are going to explain to you how nuclear energy is produced. We're gonna go from really simple to much more complex. Here we go. At its most simple, we take an atom of uranium-235. It undergoes nuclear fission. The heat that's produced from the nuclear fission produces steam. The steam turns a turbine, which turns a generator, and generators produce electricity. Let's go back and talk about this a little bit more. Our nuclear rods can be in two positions. They can be in the down position, or they can be in the up position. Think logically. When they're in the down position, they're not being shielded by, by this fuel assembly. So when they're in the down position, nuclear fission can occur more readily. If we want to stop the nuclear fission, we simply pull it up. The red portion in the fuel assembly will absorb the neutron radiation and slow and eventually stop the nuclear fission. Thus, if it's no longer undergoing nuclear fission, it's no longer producing heat, and so that slows down the power plant. This would be done um, in times when not as much energy is needed or in times in which they would like to change over the nuclear fuel, which needs to be done every few years. Here's a more complex pressurized water reactor. There are several types of reactors. They're very similar. We're only going to kind of glance across them, the differences between them. So this, you have to look at loop blue and loop red. So remember that reactor vessel from the last one? That's where my cursor is right now. When the rods are in the down position, nuclear fission can occur. When they're in the up position, nuclear fission slows. 
So let's assume that since it's red, it's in the down position and we are making energy. So it's undergoing the control rods um, or the, the rods are undergoing nuclear fission. You see this loop? All of this water is the radioactive water. It cycles around and around and around. Notice how it does not touch the section where the steam is being generated. So this is super pressurized, hot, very, very hot water. It is vaporizing this water in the blue section. When that water vaporizes, it goes to a, a steam generator, excuse me, a, a steam turbine, which spins a generator, which produces electricity. Then that, that material is condensed. This loop that you see here, those are those big towers that you saw where, where the heat was getting vented off. It gets condensed and goes back through the loop. So this water, this blue water is never radioactive. And then you can see that the electricity is going out to light up the city in the background. Pressurized water reactor. This is just a list of what's going on in the pressurized water reactor. If you'd like to read more about this, you can pause the video now. All right, here is our reactor safety design. So do not memorize this. Okay, this is just here so that you can see what kinds of items are wrapped around the nuclear rods to ensure that the neutron radiation never leaves the reactor. So let's just read the materials. You have concrete and steel and more steel and more concrete and concrete and steel. Hopefully you can see the pattern there. Concrete and steel are very good at stopping neutron radiation and ensuring that that nuclear uh, reactivity never gets outside the nuclear power plant. This is just one more picture of that reactor. I like it because it it gives you an idea of the control room, showing you that there are scientists that are here that are actually, you know, controlling what's going on. You can see again the rods, you can see the purple loop, this is the radioactive loop, versus the blue loop, the non radioactive loop. You can see that the, the condensers, um, this one is going out to the ocean for hours this would be the big um the big cement towers and this wouldn't be an ocean this would actually be the schuylkill river but again this is non-radioactive material then you have your turbine your generator and your consumer uh, this is a tour of the nuclear power plant please feel free to watch it at your leisure like i said there are many types of nuclear power plants the difference between them is not something that we really need to focus on, but I just wanted to give you a moment to show you that there were other ones. Also, I wanted to give you a moment to see that sometimes other fuels are used, for example, plutonium, um, and there are also things called thorium reactors. Nuclear waste. This is always the downside to every story. The fact is that nuclear waste is produced in a nuclear power plant. Videos on that. Now, we try to deal with nuclear waste firstly by reprocessing it, and we can reprocess it so that it can be used again, but usually only once. The problem is that there is no national repository to put all of the nuclear waste. So nuclear waste is actually stored at each individual nuclear power plant site. And this leads to problems because it means that that nuclear waste needs to be watched forever, even after the power plant has closed. Um, this Yucca Mountain, okay, Yucca Mountain was supposed to be the national repository, but it's in Utah, the citizens of Utah don't want it. And so even though we've spent billions of dollars um, at Yucca Mountain and other locations, we've never managed to do a national repository for our waste disposal. So here is a very quick explanation of um, when we recycle the nuclear fuel. So again, this is the process you already know. We mine, we mill. We convert it into a gas. We then enrich, we make fuel pellets. They go into the nuclear reactor and they live out their life, undergoing nuclear fission. Now, we can 
either once we remove them from the nuclear reactor, we can put them in storage, then they can either be reprocessed and re-enriched, or if they've already undergone one, one cycle, in other words, they've been reprocessed once, they will then go to final uh, disposal, which happens on the site of the nuclear power plant. So once it finally gets to the end of its life, it's going to spend 10 to 20 years in a very cold pool where it's basically going to live out its radical, crazy, super hot years. After 10 to 20 years, its radioactivity actually becomes more, uh, mo more moderated and then it can go to dry storage um, until this central permanent burial site may or may not ever come to be. This is what the spent fuel cooling pools look like. This water is super cooled. In other words, it's very, very, very cold. And you can see each of these is the X core of a nuclear reactor. Here is just simply another picture of the, of the pools, just so you can get an idea with people in it, how enormous um, these facilities really are. This is our dry casking system. I'm going to show you several photographs. This is where the, they're being loaded from the wet pool into the dry cask. And this is where they're stored. They're literally just stored outside the nuclear power plant um, in the secure dry cask facilities. One more picture of dry storage on site. Now, these pods are really super constru well constructed. And you'll see that you have the reactor fuel rods way in the center. Then this shouldn't be a surprise. You have steel, lead, steel, a neutron shield, and then steel. And then an impact absorber, just in case anything should ever hit the cask. Notice that this is very similar to reactor design in that we're basically trying to keep all of that neutron radiation inside the cask so that it never gets out into the wider environment. These casks are really durable. Let me show you what happens when they intentionally strike one with a train. You can see there is the cask, there it is getting struck, and even with an intentional violent strike, um, th this cask does not burst open. Thus, even though the outside is damaged, the radiation inside will stay um, hidden. Now, um, waste burial. I'll just let you scan through this slide for a moment. Uh, if you need more time with it, just hit pause because I, I essentially went over this stuff um, on, on the waste burial. Uh, ideally, again, I said we'd like to put it in a central repository, but that has not yet, um, yet happened. And notice this uh, radioactivity decays within a thousand years. It takes a thousand years for nuclear waste to become reasonably uh, non-radioactive. Here is Yucca Mountain. There's a video on it uh, and it's in the notes section. Let's see what the actual area of Yucca Mountain looks like so you can get the idea why it was chosen, um, potentially chosen as the national repository. This is the area around Yucca Mountain. You can see that it's very dry, uh, very arid. There's nobody living there. So the idea of somebody coming in contact with this nuclear material is very low. Essentially, what they wanted to do was dig down. And you can see that, the, that this is where they were basically going to dig into the side of the mountain. And they were just going to load the casks that you saw into the mountain so that there would be one location for all of the nuclear waste and it wouldn't have to be watched over at each individual location. Here's another slide. Step one, bring the nuclear material in by train. Step two, check and make sure that all of the nuclear material is, is still safe after its journey. Step three, put it in to Yucca Mountain on ramps. Basically, they, it just goes on little train cars underneath, and then it gets loaded into the, into the tunnels. We're going to see a cross section of that tunnel right now. Oops, sorry about that. 
So here are each of those casks getting loaded into a tunnel. And you can see that they're obviously, they are shielded and then the, the tunnels are shielded to make sure that this material is, um, is never impacted. Here is the entrance to Yucca Mountain. The interior of Yucca Mountain, this is where that they would send them down on the train cars. But remember, no actual, it's called transuranic waste is the official name for it. Transuranic waste means material that has actually come out of, out of a nuclear reactor. None of it has ever been stored here. And here's a little political cartoon. Obviously, you know, the citizens of Utah don't really want this material. And this is why, because this is the, uh, I took this for this next photograph. This is what the area around Yucca Mountain looks like. It's, they say that it's a contaminated area. And so people obviously do not want this in their backyard. Um, I hope that you enjoyed learning more about nuclear power uh, and that you can start to make up your own mind. Do you think it's worth it? Do you think it's not worth it? Is the carbon um, free emissions worth the difficulty with nuclear waste? The answer is, I don't know, but I want you to think very hard as, as we look at our future chapters on global climate change, what's the greater evil um, and, and which will have the greater or less impact on human life.